Uh, it is really a pleasure to be here in, in Los Angeles uh, and to specifically be here at UCLA. Uh, it is also an honor for me to be given the opportunity to give you this lecture. Uh, as you can see, I will be talking about uh, the cultural circle of Bishop John Vitez, uh, who was certainly a 15th century uh, Central European humanist, but he was also many other things. He was also a prelate. Uh, he was also a politician, a diplomat, uh, in short, a mover and shaker in Central Europe in the late Middle Ages. Um, so, uh, first, to, to start with, uh, I will uh, begin with explaining, uh, in short, uh, Vitas' uh, career, uh, his cultural uh, achievements and endeavors, and after that, we will uh, move on to the main point of our lecture, uh, the cultural circles, several of them, which Vitas formed uh, through his career. Um, he was born uh, probably before 1405. We don't have the exact date of his birth, which is not surprising for late medieval people. Uh, he was born in the area around Kutuna and Garishnitsa. Uh, that's kind of central to eastern modern Croatia. Uh, and he was a scion of a very old uh, very old family uh, whose uh, roots can be found in the 13th century, but it was a, it was a relatively unimportant family. Uh, their members did not hold any important functions. Uh, they were not very rich. They were kind of on the poor side, uh, but still it was a distinguished family. Uh, his grandfather, Gerard, uh, died while his sons uh, were still minors. Uh, so, as it usually happened, their uh, inheritance was usurped by their, by their uncles, and it took uh, Vitas' father and his brothers several decades to reclaim their ancestral estates. However, this loss of inheritance uh, prompted Vitas' father, Dennis, to become a soldier uh, in the service of King Sigismund, which was very fortunate for him, and it propelled his son's career. Uh, Dennis formed uh, a, a relation with the king's court, with the king's Hungarian court, because Sigismund had several courts. He was also uh, the king of the Romans, uh, uh, king of Bohemia, and so on. Uh, so uh, Dennis got some new estates from King Sigismund. This improved his personal standing, and he probably uh, helped his son to obtain a function at the royal court. Uh, that is probably why we find Vitas as a scribe in the Hungarian royal chancery in the 1430s. Uh, Vitas advanced through the ranks rather, rather quickly. Uh, he became a proto-notary after only a few years of service. Uh, after that, we find him uh, as a personal confidant of the region of Hungary, uh, Janos Hunyadi. Uh, he composed uh, official missives. He represented uh, Hungary in important uh, diplomatic events. And for his services, he was awarded with ecclesiastical benefices. This was usual for late medieval uh, civil servants in the Kingdom of, in the, in the kingdom of Hungary. Uh, his first uh, benefice was that of the sacristan of the Zagreb Cathedral, which he was awarded in 1438. And after that, he became provost of the chapter of Orada and in today's Romania, uh, Najvarad in, in Hungarian in 1442. Uh, his first episcopal service was when he became bishop of Orada in 1445 uh, due to very complex political circumstances, uh, which were kind of difficult to disentangle. Uh, I will not go into them right now. Uh, and after that in 1452, also, thanks to even more complicated political circumstances, he became the privy chancellor of King Ladislaus V of Habsburg. Uh, his support, Vitas' support, was crucial in bringing Matthias Corvinus to the throne of Hungary in 1458. There was a lot of backroom politicking regarding that. Vitas secured the support of several key persons, and he was also in contact with Matthias personally, who was still a child back then. Uh, and who was in uh, custody in Prague uh, in a, uh, earlier historiography like to say that he was imprisoned. He was basically in house arrest in the care of uh, the, the uh, regent of Bohemia, uh, George of Podilev. So uh, 
Due to his support, uh, Vitas obtained very important positions at the Hungarian court uh, during the reign of, of Matthias Corvinus. He also staunchly supported Matthias uh, through several, several uh, setbacks during his, his early reign. For example, during the first rebellion against Matthias' rule in 1459, uh, Vitas firmly stood behind him. Uh, and during the second rebellion, the so-called Transylvania rebellion in 1467, Vitas was also one of the few prelates who firmly stood by Matthias. Um, he was appointed as high and privy chancellor in, of Hungary in 1464. And a year later, uh, he was appointed an archbishop uh, as the archbishop of Estergom and primate of the kingdom of Hungary. Uh, he also, uh, probably would have become a cardinal if he lived any longer. But however, during the uh, last years of his life, his career took a turn for much worse. Uh, his relations with King Matthias uh, collapsed. Uh, and uh, during the last year of his life, uh, he was put in house arrest. Uh, and basically he died while in house arrest after a long and very, very painful sickness. We have testimonies speaking of Vitas dying in, in enormous pain. It's probable that he has some, some sort of urinary tract infection because there, are, there is information that he had, he had kidney stones, which hurt him so much that he could barely walk. So it was a long and terrible illness. Uh, now regarding Vitas's cultural pursuits throughout his career, uh, we know very little about his formal education. Uh, we know that he enrolled in the University of Vienna in 1434, and these connections with the University of Vienna are obvious in his cultural pursuits throughout his career. Uh, he probably did not attain any degrees, and he certainly left the university before 1437, uh, which gives him enough time to obtain a bachelor's degree. And it's possible that he did hold it uh, because back then the University of Vienna did not record the names of those who passed the bachelor's exam. So we kind of don't have a way of, uh, uh, of uh, seeing that. Uh, he probably developed an interest in astronomy during his days in Vienna because it was the uh, hub of astronomical studies of late medieval Europe. Uh, foremost astronomers of this time taught in Vienna, uh, primarily John of Gmunden, who was one of the uh, best astronomers of the 15th century. Uh, he wrote several treatises, which were, which, were, which were very similar to the treatises which Wittes himself commissioned from other authors later in his career, for example, on, the, on eclipses, on astronomical devices, and so on. It was previously thought uh, by early 20th century historiography uh, that Vitas developed an interest in humanism uh, through contact with Pier Paolo Vergerio, uh, the elder. Uh, that is not likely. Uh, Vergerio did live in Hungary uh, for the last several, several decades of his life, but there is unfortunately no proof that he had any contact with Vitas. Uh, it is much much more likely that Vitas developed an interest in humanism through contact with contemporary diplomats. Uh, primarily, uh, we have uh, Johannes de Dominis, a very prominent Dalmatian diplomat uh, who was also interested uh, in humanism. And he also worked like Vitas uh, for Hungarian diplomacy. So it's possible that through those connections, Vitas got in contact with other uh, humanists. I will go further into this a bit later. Uh, Vitas attempted to depart for Italy at least twice uh, uh, in 1445 and 1451, apparently to study there. In 1445, he was uh, allegedly stopped uh, from leaving uh, the Kingdom of Hungary by the bond of Croatia, because apparently he was too valuable to be captured by, by, en by enemies. And in 1451, he asked, the permission, uh, he asked the permission from the Pope uh, to depart both to the East and to the West uh, to further his studies of theology and preaching. Uh, so uh, this to the East could mean that he wanted to depart, to depart for Constantinople, which was also an important center of studies in the late Middle Ages. And this to the West probably meant that, uh, but he uh, did not manage to go 
uh, then as well because uh, because very uh, the very dangerous political situation was formed uh, soon after his arrest. Uh, as a bishop of Arada, he became famous for owning a magnificent library. We don't know how many of these books were actually bought by him during his early years as bishop because he had severe uh, financial problems during his uh, first years as Bishop of Arada. It's possible that he inherited most of his library from earlier Bishops of Arada. Uh, this uh, we can assume because several Italians were Bishops of Arada before him. Uh, for example, Andrea Scolari, uh, who was also Bishop of Zagreb for a short time. And uh, uh, there was also uh, uh, Vita's predecessor at the, at the Episcopal See of Arada. So it's possible that some of this library was previously owned by other bishops. Uh, we know that he did collect books, that he commissioned uh, some of them from his own scribes. There was even a theory that the scriptorium existed in Arada during his time. Uh, we know of only one book that was certainly uh, produced in Arada during, uh, during Vita's episcopate. And that is a copy of Tertullian's Apologeticus. Uh, you can see uh, here at the bottom of the slide, the colophon at the end of this manuscript saying that it was produced for Vitas, uh, who was Bishop of Orada at the time, uh, in Orada uh, by uh, a priest called Bryce. Uh, another thing Vitas is famous for is his collection of letters. Uh, he produced uh, the first and uh, probably the most famous medieval collection of letters in the Kingdom of Hungary and Croatia. Uh, it was edited by his secretary, uh, Paul of Ivanich. And uh, you, can see, you can see a picture here. It is today kept in the National Library of Austria. Uh, this is the text. And here on the sides, you can see uh, Paul's commentaries. Uh, because Paul apparently thought that it was necessary to explain some of Vitas' sentences which are kind of kind of weird to contemporary readers because Vitas did not have a humanistic way of uh, a humanistic style of writing. His style was kind of old fashioned, which reflects his education. Uh, he was probably uh, scholastically inclined. Uh, and later when he did develop an interest in humanism, we don't know whether this is a, a truly internal interest, interest in humanism or just affectation. It's very possible that he just wanted to maintain an image of a patron of humanistic arts. Uh, so to go to the uh, central part uh, of our lecture today, and the first hypothetical cultural circle uh, of Johannes Vitas uh, was allegedly uh, gathered in Arada during the 1440s. Now, uh, this is more of theory than it is, uh, than it is fact, uh, but according to Filippo Bonacorsi, uh, the so-called Kalimachus experience. Vitas hosted humanist debates in which uh, several uh, humanists of the time, uh, namely George of Sanok from Poland, Pier Paolo, Pier Pier Paolo Vergerio the Elder, and Filippo Podokatero of Cyprus uh, took part. Uh, this, is, uh, this information is brought by only one source. It is a biography of George of Sanok written by Filippo Bonacorsi uh, several decades after these alleged uh, discussions took place. Uh, and it is very likely that Filippo Bonacorsi either, either misunderstood or misrepresented some of the information. Uh, there is no evidence that Vitas hosted any <laughs> debates during his early days as Bishop of Orada. And uh, it is also uh, a firm, uh, a firm piece of evidence that this did not happen, uh, that Pier Paolo Vergerio died before Vitas became uh, Bishop of Orada. So this is not very likely. Uh, however, we do have information that Vitas' first circle of humanistically inclined acquaintances consisted uh, of Nicholas Lasotsky of Poland, who was Dean of Krakow at this time, uh, Tado Delia Adelmari, uh, who later became uh, a pontifical physician, and probably John the Dominus, uh, who was then Bishop of Seine, and also a diplomat uh, in the Hungarian uh, kingdom service, and the Popal Legate in the Kingdom of Hungary. Uh, this was a very diverse group 
Nicholas Sosotsky was particularly interesting because he had personal contacts uh, with uh, Guarino Veronese in Ferrara. It is likely that Nicholas Sosotsky recommended Guarino school to Vitez, and Vitez later sent uh, his nephew, uh, the famous po poet Janus Pannonius, to study in Ferrara, and also a number of other students. Uh, Nicholas Lasotsky is probably this link between Vitez and Ferrara. Uh, we know that Lasotsky recommended several of his own uh, relatives uh, to Gorino Veronese, and also the relatives of some other Polish uh, prelates, for example, of the Bishop of Lotzlovek. Uh, and and uh, we have some interesting information about Gorino's relations with those students. For example, he insisted to be paid on time, uh, and, and the Polish students complained about that. Uh, so, um, but the important thing is that Nicholas Sosotsky is probably the link between Vitas and Ferrara. Tado Adelia del Mari uh, is a more uh, complex uh, person. We know that he did reside in Hungary for a time, and we have firm evidence that he maintained contacts with Vitas. Uh, how much humanistically inclined he really was, probably not very much but he was an important link between Vitas and the apostolic uh, curia in Rome. Uh, he was uh, an official in the Popal Chancery, and later he became the Pope's personal physician, Pope Nicholas V. Uh, we also know that he uh, did some very suspicious financial transactions in Vitas's favor, because Vitas was, as I said, uh, he had serious financial problems during his first years as Bishop of Ferrada. He was unable to pay uh, for his uh, popal confirmation. And Tado was probably the person who smoothed these, uh, these uh, snacks over, and he probably borrowed him some money to cover these expenses in Rome. We know this because later, uh, Vita sent a very rude letter to Tado saying, basically, I gave you your money, now leave me alone. <laughs> Uh, John the Dominus is also an, an interesting person. Uh, he, is, uh, he was a Dalmatian from Rab. He was Bishop of Seine, and later he became Bishop of uh, Orada. So basically, Vitas uh, succeeded him as Bishop of Orada. It is probable that during Vitas' early years in the Hungarian Chancery, uh, John the Dominus was the person who noticed him and who advanced his career. Uh, I already, I already mentioned Nicholas Sosotsky. Uh, it is interesting to note that it was Polish humanists who were especially important in Vitas' early career. Uh, we have Lasotsky. We also have Cardinal Zbigniew and Woloszynski. Uh, we also know that Vitas had at least one short contact with the uh, chronicler of the Kingdom of Poland, Jan Bugos, and, the late, and later the astrologer Martin Kroll of Żuravica, who took the uh, Atlantica name Rex, because Kroll means king in Polish, uh, resided at Vitas's court and probably influenced him in a way because uh, Kroll uh, wrote several treatises which were very similar to those which Vitas later commissioned from his own astrologers. Uh, Kroll was a doctor of medicine and an astronomer, but he practiced mainly astrology. And as I will later explain, astrology was one of Vitas' main interest, interests throughout his career. Um, despite his lack of funds uh, as Bishop of Aradia during his early years, there is evidence of him collecting books and owning uh, very high quality books, even in the late 1440s. For example, we know that uh, Cardinal Olesznicki uh, requested a copy of uh, Levi's Roman history from Vitas, because apparently Vitas owned a very high quality copy of it. Uh, there, is, there are also other books which were, which were maybe produced during these early years. I already, I, I already mentioned uh, Tertullian's Apologeticus. There is also an exchange of books with Silvio Piccolomini. Uh, both uh, Piccolomini ordered, uh, borrowed books from Vitas and Vitas borrowed books from, from Piccolomini. This I will explain a bit later. Uh, it is also important to note that Vitas supported numerous Hungarian and Slavonian students in Italy. And this is probably the most important part in him is his, of his self-promotion. Uh, he presented himself as a, as a patron of the arts. And these students in Italy spread his fame throughout Italy and Italian humanists heard of him 
And later he became this image of a wise man in a distant country. Uh, for example, we, we, we will later see that Italian humanists who, who never met him uh, dedicated their books to him and extolled his virtues, his knowledge, uh, his uh, study of the arts and so on. Uh, these students whom Vita supported were uh, primar primarily his nephew, Janus Pannonius. Then we have Nicholas Barius, uh, George Polycar Costolani, and there were several others of whom we know just their names. Uh, so we don't know whether they re returned later to Hungary, to Hungary or not. Uh, but we do know that these persons later entered Vitas's service. So Vitas was basically educating his, his future retainers. Uh, they all later became uh, very high position prelates in the Hungarian hierarchy. For example, Janus Pannonius became uh, Bishop of Pech. Uh, Nicholas Barius was his predecessor in the Episcopal See of Pech, but he died early. And uh, George Polycarp later became Vitas's personal secretary. Uh, he also later married the daughter of uh, George of Trebizond, also an important Italian humanist, a humanist, so we have that connection as well. I will get into this later. Uh, the first real circle uh, of scholars Vitas formed uh, was formed in the 1450s. This is the time when Vitas entered the court of Ladislaus V of Habsburg. Ladislaus V ruled an enormous kingdom, a composite kingdom. Uh, he was a king of Bohemia, king of Hungary, king of Croatia, also Duke of Austria. Uh, so it was a big and complex commonwealth. Uh, through participating in his court, Vitas was introduced to high politics. He forged acquaintanceships with leading diplomats of the era. Uh, for example, he resided at, king, at the king's court in Prague uh, for almost a year. Uh, and it was noted. It was noted that he was one of the few Hungarian uh, prelates uh, in, uh, close to the king. Uh, he met the foremost diplomats uh, of Central Europe, such as Prokop of Rabstein, uh, also Ulrich von Nussdorf, uh, and others. Uh, the most important person uh, whom he met at the time was Anna Silvia Piccolomini, who would later become Pope Pius II. Uh, their first meeting was very tumultuous. Uh, Piccolomini later wrote, and he was famous for self-aggrandizement. He later wrote that Vitas insulted him when they first met because he allegedly uh, said something very rude about uh, Emperor Frederick III, uh, who was Piccolomini's uh, favorite at the time. Uh, so Piccolomini responded that there was a fight. Uh, but later they became friends, conditionally speaking, uh, because they exchanged very sensitive information. So it's probably that they, they were basically probing each other for information, trying to uh, get as many confidential information out of each other as possible. Uh, later, Vitas played an important role in having Piccolomini uh, elected as cardinal. And Piccolomini later had helped Vitas to get, some, uh, to get out of some trouble of his own. Uh, so uh, it, was a, it was a very valuable friendship to have. Uh, for this lecture, it's important to note that the Nassilio Piccolomini uh, was especially important for the Vitas' rep rep reputation. Uh, he recommended several other humanists to Vitas, for example, Niccolò Lisci of Volterra, uh, who was basically a, a Piccolomini's plant at the uh, Ladislaus V court. Uh, he was to report to Piccolomini any important information he would encounter. Uh, there was also Virgilio Bornati of Brescia. Uh, the title of this lecture is Astrologer, Astronomers, Theologians, and Vagabonds. Virgilio is one of the vagabonds. Uh, he traveled through, it, uh, through, through Europe. Uh, he went to Scandinavia. He went to Ireland. Uh, for example, he, he left a very thorough report of the Purgatory of St. Patrick in Ireland. And he also visited Vitas' uh, court in Prague. Uh, he was recommended to Vitas also by Nancy Levy uh, there is also an interesting thing to note. Uh, George Polycarp was financed by Vitas during his studies in Ferrara. Later, he asked Piccolomini to recommend him to Frederick III, uh, the Roman Emperor. And Piccolomini responded that he couldn't do that, but he told him uh, to report to Vitas because Vitas may have a job for him. And we know that Polycarp later became Vitas' secretary. So Vitas did have a job for him. It's, it, it's 
very interesting that he didn't ask Vitas for a job first. Uh, so we don't know why, but this is how it happened. Uh, also, uh, it's important to note that exchanging books was a practice contemporary humanists really liked. Uh, Piccolomini and Vitas exchanged several books. We know that Vitas requested from Piccolomini a copy of Tertullian's works. Tertullian was, was apparently one of his favorite authors. We have instances of, of him quoting Tertullian in his own speeches. And we know that Piccolomini requested from Vitas a copy of a book on Hungarian history. We don't know which one, uh, but it's important to note that an exchange of books did occur between them. They also exchanged secrets, some very confidential secrets. Uh, so this friendship had a practical side to it as well. Uh, as I said earlier, astrology, which was, which was at that time connected with astronomy, uh, was among Vitas's chief interests uh, throughout his career. Uh, he has expressed the most interest in the most interest in contacts with astrologers, even during this time, during the 1450s. Uh, it's interesting to note how these uh, acquaintanceships were formed. Uh, for example, we know uh, that the Neasilio Piccolomini recommended uh, the Bohemian astrologer Johannes Nihili to Vitas. Uh, during his time in Prague. Johannes Nihili was a friend of George uh, Georg von Poebach, George of Poebach. So it's probable that Poebach got in contact with Vitas through Johannes Nihili. Uh, it's also important to note that Georg von Poebach composed several treatises for Vitas. For example, we see here a copy of his Quadratum Geometricum. Uh, it's an astronomical device uh, device for measuring altitude. Uh, Feuerbach constructed this device for Vitas, and he also wrote a treatise on its use. That's the usual, that's the usual pattern uh, in that time. An astronomer would construct the device, and he will also uh, write something like instructions for its use. Um, so uh, later astrologers will form the core of Vitas's cultural circle. Uh, here, uh, we can see uh, what I have just uh, explained to you uh, in a more uh, easy to understand fashion. So uh, this is the, uh, the first circle represents the persons who were introduced or recommended to Vitas by Nasa Lepicoloni. Here we have Nicola Lisci, Virgilio Bornatti, Johannes Nihili, and in the other circle, uh, we have the students supported by Vitas in the school of Guarino Veronese in Ferrari. Uh, Vitas himself never met Guarino Veronese personally. Uh, they did exchange some letters, but very basic letters, very formal letters. Uh, Guarino was basically writing to Vitas to pay his bill. And Vitas responded, okay, I will, I will pay, I will pay. Uh, so it was very likely that this uh, uh, line went to Nikola Sosotsky, that he was the link connecting Vitas and Ferrara. Uh, I promised earlier uh, to talk more about astrologers. Uh, Vitas's interest in astronomy uh, was dictated by his reliance on astrological prognostication. It was noted by contemporaries that he would allegedly do nothing without first consulting the position of the stars. Uh, this was written uh, by Galeotto Marzio. Uh, he commissioned uh, numerous treatises about the motion of the planets, about the motion of the heavens, and he, he commissioned several astronomical devices as well. Um, astronomical devices of the time were reasonably precise uh, but the tools needed for their correct use needed much calculation. So uh, basically we have astronomers working for Vitas around the clock to produce very exact and very, uh, very numerous calculations so that he could predict the motion, the motion of the planets, which was used expressly for casting horoscopes. Horoscopes were Vitas's real interest. Uh, the point, of, and, and this is this is really an important thing. We have a whole era of astronomy developing, calculating, predicting, just for the purpose of casting horoscopes. Um, 
So uh, Georg von Feuerbach constructed the geometric, geometric square for Vitas, uh, Johannes Regio Montanus, Feuerbach's student, later constructed a trochettum, also a complex astronomical device for Vitas. Uh, and we know that Vitas's particular interests included the calculations of the cusps of astrological houses. He basically wanted to know the positions of the houses of the zodiac. Um, even more exact calculations were needed for that. Uh, there were several methods for calculating this, and Vitas' astronomers devised new ones during their time in Vitas' service. Uh, these are enormous sign tables because it's geometry of a curve. You can't really use triang triangulation for that. You need sign tables. Uh, you need algebra. Uh, Vitas' astronomers, for example, Johannes Regimontanus, calculated these tables. Uh, this is the, this is the uh, on the left, you can see a picture representing the position of the sun and the moon uh, for several millennia in advance. Uh, also, uh, Vitas' astronomers uh, devised uh, very advanced mathematical form formulas. And this is the time uh, when uh, the square of the binome was elaborated and when work on the cube of binome began. And later, uh, we have these same astronomers working on revolutionary things. And this was all started by Vitas' interest in, astro in astrology. Uh, and the line doesn't stop here. Uh, through Vitas' astrologers, uh, this came to later important astronomers such as Copernicus. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the astronomical revolution. Uh, uh, the, uh, I will explain some more of this later. Uh, right now, let's note some of the astronomers or astrologers in Vitus' service. Uh, he employed or retained several of them. For example, we have Georg von Feuerbach. Uh, later, we have his student, uh, Johannes Müller Regio Montanus from Königsberg in Bavaria. And we have Martin Bilitz of Volkusz in Poland. So we have Germans, Poles, we have Italians. It was really a diverse and international group. We also have Galeotto Marzio of Narni, a very interesting person of the era, one of the most controversial persons in Vitas' service. Uh, he was an uh, astrologer, but he was, he was also a doctor of medicine, and he, li he liked to mix the two. Uh, he was a friend of Janus Pannonius. They studied together in Ferrara, and he later came to Hungary uh, for se several times. He stayed at Vitas' court, and he wrote several books, which he, some of which he dedicated to Vitas. Uh, he was also later investigated by the, by the Inquisition uh, for holding quite controversial beliefs about the nature of the world, but that was after Vitas, Vitas died. We also have temporary context among, among uh, contemporary astrologers. For example, I already mentioned uh, Martin Kroll Rex. Uh, we, have, we also have Johannes Nicheli of Bohemia. And we have John Gazovich of Dubrovnik, a very interesting person uh, who, uh, who worked on the method of calculating the cusps of the houses of the zodiac. Uh, his method apparently conflicted with Regio Montanus's method. Uh, so we only know his work on, on this, on this uh, theory uh, through his conflicts with Regio Montanus. Basically, Regio Montanus wrote that. And there is this other guy working on this subject, and he, he is not really good. Uh, my method is better. Uh, this is important because Gazelich's book uh, on this method is lost. Uh, we know that Vitas did own it. Gazelich sent it to him personally, uh, but this book is lost, so we only know about it through uh, Regimentanus's critiques. Uh, now we come to the heights of Vitas's career the time when he was an, uh, a person of great power, a uh, person behind King Matthias's throne in the late 1450s and the early 1460s. This is the time when the Oradia circle of humanists solidified. Uh, in 1458, Vitus's nephew, Janus Pannonius, returned from Italy. He was immediately awarded high ecclesiastical benefices in the Kingdom of Hungary. In 1459, he became Bishop of Pech. And he also brought with him many contacts. Uh, most importantly, uh, there was Galeotto Marzio, his former student, but there were others. For example, there was protests of Voskovice, uh, Bishop of Olomouc in, in Moravia, 
who was also Janus Pannonius's acquaintance. And there was also perhaps Cardinal Basil Vesarion. Uh, I will mention the, these contacts with him a bit later. Uh, Nicholas of Modrus, uh, he is called Nicholas of Modrus because he was, he was Bishop of Modrus. He was not born in Modrus. And he was also a very important diplomat in the service of the Kingdom of Hungary. Uh, he later became a member, member of the Popal Court, uh, also a famous theologian. And he was also a member of Vitesse Circle. Uh, in a dedication of one of his books, Nicholas mentioned an unforgettable winter, which he spent at Vitesse's court in Oradea, surrounded by books and engaged in scholarly discussions with his colleagues. Now, who these colleagues were, we don't know exactly, but Galeotto Marzio was also in Hungary at that time, so it's probable that he was one of these colleagues who participated in, in discussions in Rada. And this is the time when discussions probably did occur in Rada, not during the 1440s, but during the 1460s. Another member, uh, another participant in these discussions was probably Anus Pannonius, and there were also other possible uh, members. So uh, now we have a time where Vitesse's court was truly a humanistic court and truly a court where uh, humanism, uh, a, focal, a focal point from which humanism spread through the Kingdom of Hungary. Uh, this is also the time where Vitesse was one of the most important politicians in Central Europe. For example, here on the bottom of the slide, you have a quote uh, by the Popal Nuncio and Archbishop of Crete, Girolamo Lando, saying that Vitesse's word is worth more than that of all the other Hungarian prelates combined. And that, that's how much influence he held at the court of Hungary. Here on the left, you see an example of Galeotos Marcio's uh, book dedicated to Vitus called the Homine Libri Duo. It's a book of uh, mainly medical astrology. Uh, it represents Galeotto Marcio's view of the world and the human body. And on the right, uh, you can see a book by uh, a book, a manuscript containing letters of Pliny the, the Younger. And it's important because it contains Vitas's coat of arms on the bottom. Uh, so this is this is Vitas's coat of arms. Uh, it's held by two putti. Uh, in the uh, top half, you have a pacing lion, and on the bottom half, you have a lily surrounded by two stars. This is not heraldically correct. I'm not using the correct terms. Uh, but this is how it looks like, what it looks like. Uh, an interesting detail. Uh, these putti have small necklaces with crosses on them. A person painted those later. They were not in the, the original painting. And they're painting in, in red in a similar ink to what wheat is used uh, to note on the, mar on the margins. So it's possible that, that he painted them. Maybe he thought it was cute. Uh, now it's uh, important to explain two things. Uh, we don't know that much about Vitas' scholarly, personal scholarly knowledge and pursuits because, because he didn't write about them. Uh, what we do know of them uh, can be gathered through books annotated by Vitas, and there are many of them, uh, and they enable us to study his literary, li literary interests and his personal knowledge. Uh, here on the top left, you can see his note on a manuscript containing a theological work by Francis of Mehon uh, called Conflatus. Uh, this is a note uh, containing uh, uh, basically Vitus' personal note about when he began reading the book and when he finished. This is in the, at the end of the manuscript. It, it took him about a month to read this book, which is quite good pacing because it's an enormous work of theology. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages of manuscript. And uh, books dedicated to Vitas make up another significant port, uh, proportion of information on his contacts among humanists. We have a lot of books which were dedicated to Vitas, and most of the dedications extol his Christian virtues uh, and scholarly, scholarly pursuits. Uh, these depend, uh, the uh, praises depend on the character of the, uh, of the author. For example, we have astronomers uh, praising Vitas's mathematical skills, uh, his astronomical pursuits, and so on. And then we have persons writing about theology, extolling his theological knowledge, knowledge and so on. Apparently, he was quite a famous theologer at the time. Uh, he was also a famous preacher, uh, but unfortunately, we don't know of any of his sermons. None, none were preserved. Perhaps there are some waiting in manuscripts, uh, but we don't know that there are his. 
Uh, here on the bottom right, you can see an example of a book dedicated to Vitas. It was written by Nicholas of Modrus. Uh, this is maybe not maybe the autograph. Uh, it's a dialogue on the uh, fortunes of mortals, the Mortalium Felicitate. Uh, it was examined by my dear friend uh, Lukas Poderich, and it's preserved in the uh, uh, Austrian National Library uh, in Vienna. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the time where Ritus, when Ritus was at the heights of his career. In 1465, uh, he was appointed as Archbishop of Estergom, and he established a very illustrious court in Estergom, which was famous throughout Europe uh, for its uh, beauty, for its architectural endeavors, for its, and mainly for its uh, humanistic circles. Um, Vitas gathered some of the top most and some of the most controversial minds of his time in Estergon. These were jo uh, Galotto Marzio, uh, Giovanni Gatti, Johannes Regimontanus, uh, Martin Bilica, who, uh, whom we mentioned earlier. Uh, and allegedly, according to Galeotto, King Matthias Corvinus himself participated in scholarly discussions that, to, that took place uh, in Estergon. Uh, how much time Vitas could have spent in Estergom uh, is difficult to discern because his time as archbishop was not a peaceful time. Uh, he spent uh, much of this uh, period uh, working as a diplomat in royal, in royal service, and he also took part in several wars fought by King Matthias. So the pe periods, uh, the longer periods of time which he spent in Estergom were rare. Uh, we know that most of 1470, he did spend in Estergom, and that was the time when he was really sick, uh, when he could barely walk, so it's understandable that he probably took some time to recover there. Um, and his court was a place of intense scholarly production as well. Uh, these authors, uh, these humanists, produced many of their works while they were in Estergom uh, in Vitas' service. We already mentioned Galeotto's De Homine Libre Duo, and Johannes Segimontanus, produced several of his treatises while he was in Estergom. For example, Tabula Primi Mobilis, uh, a sign table calculating the motion of the stars uh, for several millennia in advance. And there is also the Tabula Directionum et Perfectionum, which he later tended to print under the name Ludus Pannoniensis, Pannonian game. Uh, this image uh, you can see on the slide uh, is very controversial. Uh, while he was Archbishop of Estergom, Vitas allegedly commissioned many ar architectural uh, works there. Uh, he built a gallery made of red marble. Uh, he built a chapel. Uh, he, built, he also allegedly built a whole room in his palace painted with uh, astrological murals. We don't know whether they were really, really his, uh, but they were painted. Pieces of them were found, little, little chunks of them were found. So they really existed. And this is one of the uh, frescoes which were discovered also in very small pieces in the ruins of uh, Vitas' palace representing the cardinal virtues. Um, the Hungarians are very proud of this uh, fresco. They put it in a stamp. And there were also theories about uh, this being a, an early work of Botticelli's. Uh, this is not likely. But it's a really high quality fresco, so it was probably executed by uh, capable uh, painters. Uh, I promised earlier to speak about uh, Bessarion. Uh, there is no evidence that Vitas ever met Bessarion, but it is possible. Bessarion was a popal legate uh, working in the Kingdom of Hungary and the Duchy of Austria uh, during the early 1460s. He participated in negotiations between Emperor Frederick, Frederick III and Matthias Corvinus, the King of Hungary. Vitas was Matthias' representative in these negotiations. So it's possible that Vitas and Bessarion did meet during this period. Uh, however, we are certain that Vitas knew of Bessarion and that he was familiar with his work because he, he told us so himself in his notes uh, in some of the manuscripts he read he was definitely aware of Bessarion's writings. Uh, also, it's important to note that some of the retainers were members of both circles, Vitas's and Bessarion's. For example, Johannes Regimontanus 
served as Bessarion's chaplain and secretary for a long time during the 1460s. And it was from Bessarion's service that he went into Vitas's service. There is also Martin Bilica, uh, who was not strictly a member of Bessarion's circle. He was a court astrologer of uh, Pietro Barbo, who later became Pope Paul II. Uh, but he was also familiar with Bessarion's work and endeavors. And there, there is Giovanni Gatti, the Italian theologian. Uh, Gatti was later a member of the Sarian circle after his return from Hungary uh, to Italy. Uh, and it's an, it, he's also an important link between t these two great patrons of the arts, uh, Bessarion and Vitas. Uh, here you can see two examples of manuscripts, both commissioned by Vitas and dedicated to Vitas. Uh, most of the manuscripts dedicated to Vitas and of those commissioned by him date from the 60s and the early 1470s. This is a time when Vitas was very rich and powerful. Um, here on the left, uh, you can see a copy of Plautus's uh, comedies, uh, which contains both Vitas's coat, uh, coat of arms and the Hungarian uh, royal coat of arms at the top. Uh, there are some theories that this book was presented by Vitas to King Matthias Corvinus. It is also preserved today uh, at the Austrian National Library uh, in Vienna. Here on the bottom, there are two portraits. Uh, it's possible that the left portrait represents Vitas himself. At least that's what earlier historians thought. And the portrait of the right might represent his nephew, Janus Panotus. We are not certain of this, but if it is so, this is one of the few uh, pictorial representations of Vitas that we have. Uh, here on the right, uh, you can see an example of a book dedicated to Vitas. This is a really small uh, manuscript containing several poems uh, by Gaspare Tribracco. And on the bottom, you can see a portrait which certainly does represent Vitas. And it was probably made by a person who, can, who, who had never seen Vitas. It was probably done by description. Uh, and around his portrait, there are letters saying Lux Pannonia, the light of Pannonia. Uh, this was made by an author who was hoping to get some financial support from Vitas. So it's likely that he was trying to butter him up. Uh, but it's important to know that this is, this is the image foreign authors had of Vitas as light of Pannonia, as a very famous patron of the arts in a very distant country. And this is interesting to see because Pannonia or Hungary at the time uh, was not seen as a, as a center of uh, European politics. And later authors, even 20th century authors, simply thought that the Renaissance did not happen in, in the Kingdom of Hungary. This is, this is ironic because we have really a lot of authors and a lot of writers uh, extolling humanism and running humanistic uh, works at this time. Uh, by then, by the 1460s and the early 1470s, uh, Vitus' circle expanded greatly. Uh, he became famous uh, among Florentine humanists, which is weird because he was never in Florence. He contacted uh, his contacts with, uh, with Florentine humanists went mainly to his protégés, uh, to Janus Pannonius, to Peter Garazda, uh, Stephen Bioni, uh, and so on. Some of the manuscripts he commissioned were produced by Florentine copyists. For example, there is a very high quality uh, copy of Levy's uh, Roman history executed by Pietro Cennini, uh, or they were bought from the famous Florentine bookseller uh, Vespasiano da Vistici. Uh, Vespasiano da Vistici wrote a book containing biographies of the famous people of his era, and one of them is Vitas, <laughs> probably because Vitas was one of his best customers. Here we have a small list of works dedicated to Vitas, and my time is running low, so I will just skip through these. Uh, and this is a selection. It's not, an, an, uh, it's not a complete list, but we have uh, Greek authors, Italian authors, uh, Germans, uh, Slavonians, and so on. Uh, it's important to note that all of these thought we, that Vitas was the person to whom they should dedicate their works. And that is because he was seen as a patron of the arts. And dedicating a work was kind of like introducing yourself uh, to the person. So if you're doing that, you're hoping to get something from that person, and that's probably support. Um, 
one of the most important cultural endeavors uh, done by Vitas in, in his uh, later career was the founding of the University of Bratislava. Uh, uh, it was called in a very uh, humanistic fashion, the Universitas Istropolitana, because Istropolis was a name uh, which humanists attached to Bratislava, the Danube city, Istropolis. Uh, in 1465, Pope Paul II permitted the founding of, of a university, and the bull was issued by Janus Pannonius, and basically the permission to found a university, to found a university was given to Vitas. Uh, Vitas selected to establish this university in Bratislava, probably because, because it was close to Vienna. And we see very close cooperation with the University of Vienna during the short time when the University of Bratislava existed. Uh, it was incorporated in 1467. The date was determined by electional astrology, because when it comes to Vitas, there, there always has to be astrology. And Vitas became its, its chancellor, and his uh, provost of Bratislava, Georg von Schoenberg, became its vice chancellor. Uh, for this purpose, he was granted episcopal authority in Bratislava and its environs. So Schoenberg is basically the forerunner of later bishops of Bratislava. Uh, he is the person who mostly did the day-to-day uh, -day business of the university, of, of running the university. Vitas did express some interest in, him, in, his, in his university during the, the early years uh, when, it, when it functioned. For example, we have uh, sources saying that he would greet students upon their arrival. Uh, that he encouraged them to uh, enroll in his university and so on. Uh, there were also uh, uniforms they would have to wear, uh, dress uniforms. Uh, but the, in the beginning of the University of Bratislava was kind of humble. Uh, it was to be modeled on the University of Paris, uh, but its closest model was really the University of Vienna. Um, the establishment was uh, also encouraged by Viennese scholars, such as the Dominican Leonard, uh, Hundpichler, uh, who was consulted uh, during the founding of the university, he offered, he offered advice on the, how the university should be founded. We know very little about the functioning of Vitas' university. Uh, for example, we do know that uh, until six, uh, 1470, it did not offer any accommodations to the students. They would have to find uh, private accommodations. Uh, later, a uh, boarding house uh, was opened. Uh, nevertheless, many of the Hungarian youths did enroll in the, in the university. There are also some graduates, so it did produce uh, some highly educated scholars of, of, of the time. Persons who taught at the university were mainly the persons who resided at Vitas' court, the scholars in his service. We have Martin Bilica, uh, we have Giovanni Gatti. Uh, both of them were previously uh, Bologna lecturers. Uh, and perhaps Galato Marzio was also teaching there. Whether Johannes Regiomontanus taught at Bratislava or not, we don't, do not know. Uh, he did previously teach in Vienna and in Padua, so it's possible that he also taught in Bratislava. Most of the professors on whom we do know were theologians, and it was apparently very difficult to obtain them. Vitas had to ask the University of Vienna to allow their graduate students to teach theology in Bratislava. Later, some experienced theologians were employed. For example, we have a, a John of Kupferberg, who was probably John Bibel, uh, and John Glogowski. Uh, they were both the theologians, but they were also astronomers. So it's also possible that Vitus was trying to gather the most excellent astronomical minds of his time at his university. And the last part of my lecture is a sad one. Unfortunately, of Vitas's work, uh, almost nothing remained. When he died in 1472, most of his cultural enterprises failed. The University of Bratislava closed several years after his death. Um, most of the scholars in his service left the Kingdom of Hungary. Uh, Johannes Regimontanus departed, he went to Nuremberg. Also, uh, Giovanni Gatti departed. The only one who stayed was Martin Bilica. And he stayed mostly because King Matthias Corvinus was interested in his work as an astrologer. He became the court astrologer uh, in royal service. Uh, those who were planning to come to Hungary never did come. 
For example, Johannes Argyropoulos was considering to move to Hungary to stay at Vitus's court, but he never did because Vitus died. Also, Bartolomeo Foncio was planning to come to Vitus uh, to stay at his court, and he was very disappointed and afraid when he heard that Vitus was out of, out of royal favor, uh, that Vitus was imprisoned. He also never arrived to Hungary, and the book which he wrote for Vitus, the Penitentia, he rededicated to, Giul to Giuliano Medici. Above the Oradea Cathedral, which was built by Vitas, there was a big collapse uh, in the late 1440s, and Vitas rebuilt the Oradea Cathedral. It was completely destroyed during the later centuries by the Ottoman Wars. And the huge palace complex he built in Estragon was also completely raised during the future centuries. There is nothing left above ground. Even the memory of where the palace stood, stood disappeared nothing remained. Very little pieces of it were later excavated. Also, Vitas's very name was forgotten. For a long time, no one knew who was this Archbishop John. And people thought that there were three persons, three different persons, John of Sredna, John of Vitas, and Archbishop John. Only in the 19th century was his life and work discovered again. So this is a sad story. But here at UCLA, <laughs> we remember Vitas. So that's not a bad thing. And I hope that we will continue to remember him, that there will be more lectures about his life and career. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>